Welcome donors, team members, and friends to the 25th annual Precious Metal event and our second virtual Precious Metal. I'm your moderator, Ross Coyle, SBC's Public Relations Officer. As with last year's program, I'm joining you today along with many of your speakers from Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto. This year, to keep our program engaging, we also added a number of pre-recorded video presentations for some variety. While we continue in this virtual format due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're glad that you could join us virtually to celebrate the incredible achievements of all of our milestone donors. We have a packed program for you today, and we're excited for you to hear it all. Please note that if you have any issues with the live stream at any point, you can reach out to SBC Donor Relations at sbcsupport at stanford.edu or call 650-736-7786 to make sure you don't miss much. This was also included in your reminder email should you need to reference it again. One final note, as a special treat for those in attendance today, we will be holding a drawing for a handful of high ticket gift cards for those who stay through the event, so be sure to stick around for entry. With that, I'd like to get things started by welcoming Harpreet Sandhu, SBC's Executive Director, to share opening remarks. Thank you, Ross. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Precious Metal. I'm so honored to be here with you today to thank you for your tireless commitment to patients and to SBC. As Ross mentioned, today is our 25th Precious Metal. That's a quarter of a century that we have been gathering to celebrate our milestone donors. Reminiscing on this wonderful tradition, I looked back at photos from our first event in which you can count just 30 donors present. Today, we have over 1,000 donors who qualify to attend. And that number is incredible for two reasons. First and foremost, it represents the strong dedication of you, our community, to become lifelong donors, to give your time and a part of yourself to help others. It's so heartening for me to think that even in a world of constant change and challenges, there continues to be those who put others first and step up to support our patients. Secondly, and most importantly, this increase, which is estimated to be more than 3,000%, has a direct correlation to the number of patients we've been able to support. And while your contributions have no doubt changed lives for the entirety of this 25 years, your tremendous impact is visible even when we zoom in on just the past 12 months. From September 2020 through August of 2021 alone, your donations helped SBC support 80,953 transfusions for patients in our community, which is a 10% increase over last year. Your donations also made possible 269 life-saving bone marrow transplants and 459 life-saving solid organ transplants which includes a record number of heart transplants for SBC to support in any given year. And your donations allowed us to create 21,765 research products, largely to support the future of patient care. It's safe to say that though your, imp through, though your impact this past year has been immediately life-saving for many patients, the impact of your selfless gifts will be left for many patients will be, excuse me, will be felt for many years to come and will give us something wonderful to talk about yet another 25 years into the future. And as we all know, the need for blood never takes a day off. So even as I stand here today, we are in particular need of platelets to meet current demand for our patients and especially over the next few days. So platelet donors, please make your earliest available appointment and thank you for your phenomenal dedication week after week. As I extend my thanks to each and every one of you today, I also want to give a special thank you to those of you who have not only supported patients, but also supported and protected all of us through your military service. Today is both Veterans Day here in the US and Remembrance Day, where I'm from in Canada, where we wear a poppy to honor those we've lost, protecting our country and people. Today, we are truly in the company of incredible human beings. 
with that, I'm excited to kick off our program, which this year we have opened up to all of our donors so we can have an even greater celebration. The theme for this year's Precious Metal Program, as you know, is healthcare innovations. And here in the Bay Area, we are part of a healthcare system like no other all over the world. And we are fortunate that some of these greatest innovations have started here in our own backyard. Though the prestige of it all can be exciting, what, is, what this really boils down to is that more patients are getting the support they need. Patients who may not have that chance in other parts of the world. It also means that those of us who are part of the SBC family, and that includes every single one of you, are a part of some of these innovations as blood products are key to these scientific discoveries. It's overwhelming to imagine how many patients of the future will benefit from what we are all doing together right now. Our chief medical officer, Dr. Ta Pham, has a direct hand in much of the innovation that takes place at SBC, particularly around our laboratories. Today, Dr. Pham will be sharing a story of both scientific innovation and real human impact. So to start off our program this morning, please enjoy this message from Dr. Ta Pham on how Stanford Blood Center became the first blood center of our size in the nation to use 100% pathogen reduction technology on our platelets, making our products as safe as possible even for even the most immunocompromised patients. Thanks, Harpreet, for the introductions. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ta Pham. I'm one of the chief medical officers here at the Stanford Blood Center. Today I'll be speaking to you about uh, the pathogen reduction technology that we fully implemented at the Stanford Blood Center uh, this past year. As a brief outline, I just want to start off with the current uh, infectious disease risks associated with transfusions currently and then move into how pathogen reduction technology reduce uh, these risks and then also uh, transition to uh, some of the future projects I'm working on to further uh, enhance these mitigation strategies. So, Current mitigation strategies, what do we have currently that help reduce the risk of uh, transfusion transmitted infections? Uh, firstly, it's very important that the donors remain volunteer donors, i.e. we don't pay them uh, any significant value, anything of significant value that would potentially provide too much of an incentive uh, for the donors. We rely on donors being fully, fully altruistic uh, to make the system work in a safe way. The reason is because it relates mainly uh, it relates to the confidential medical history questionnaire. We rely on donors to fully answer these questions um, to the best of their ability and also to be truthful because this is the first screen in ensuring that the blood is safe. <clears throat> As a second line of defense um, is, uh, we, is that we do infectious disease testing on all of our blood donations. Here's a list of the things that we do uh, that we test for HIV, HCV, HBV, West Nile, HTLV, syphilis, and T. cruzi. And for a short period of time, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually tested all of our donations for SARS-CoV-2. At that time, we didn't know if uh, SARS-CoV-2 could be transmitted via blood, and we erred on the side of safety, and we tested all our units for that. Uh, luckily, uh, as time proved, uh, it wasn't a tr transfusion transmitted disease, so we ended that, but we did not know at the time. Uh, we also do bacterial culturing uh, of many of our platelets, or we used to, but this has since transitioned to pathogen reduction technology, and we'll get to that uh, next, or in a second. So despite all the testing that we do, there is still a residual amount of risk, right? So here's the list of the current risk and the um, estimated uh, risks uh, by, the, uh, by the pathogen. You can see that most of these here are in the realm of one in millions, right? The, the one that sticks out is really the bacterial uh, contamination of platelets. Here, is as, at least here in this table, it's estimated to be one in 100,000, uh, which may be an underestimation of how likely uh, this happens. So, you know, the, the, there's a key distinction between, you know, contamination and clinical events, right? So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So contamination, the rates of contamination of a plate unit is actually a little high, and this uh, study here estimates it to be about one in about 5,000 units. So put it another way, one in 5,000 units has bacteria in there that can potentially be detected. Now that doesn't necessarily mean all these units would, be, uh, would result in a, uh, in a clinical event, 
So uh, what is the risk of, of the number of units that would result in a clinical event? So this table here <coughs> was uh, published, and that risk is about 1 in 25,000, which is considered to be an underestimation of the true risk. So that's what we're sitting at right now, between about 1 in 25,000 or so units that would be, uh, that could potentially result in a clinically significant septic event. Put that in perspective, um, that means about once every one to two years, we would have a unit here that would cause a, a clinically significant septic event in a patient at the hospital. So why platelets? Why is it that platelets are, are, are the, the, the problem here? Well, the thing about platelets is they have, they're unique in that they have to be stored at room temperature and you have to gently agitate them the whole time that they're stored. These are, these are perfect conditions for bacterial overgrowth. So if there's a, even just a small number of bacteria in the beginning, they can eventually blossom uh, if, if care is not taken. <clears throat> so what do we do? So one of the ways to do it, uh, one of the ways to sort of further mitigate these risks associated with platelets is you, by pathogen reduction technology. You know, I'm not going to go into detail, but in essence what it is is uh, PRT for short is considered a proactive method for reducing the, ca the contamination rate and it uses a small molecule that you incubate with the platelets that would e uh, essentially bind to any nucle uh, nucleotides and halt any replication or proliferation of any living thing including uh, pathogens. And it's been shown to be effective against almost all clinically significant pathogens in blood. Now, at the Stanford Blood Center, we implemented, we started the PRT implementation back in early 2018 uh, in collaboration with our medical uh, partners and administrative partners at the, uh, at the main hospitals. Over the years, we've slowly increased that, um, that production and, and distribution to those hospitals since 2018. Um, so here, in this graph just shows our increasing production uh, over the years. The top, uh, the top graph is the pediatric hospital. The bottom graph is the adult hospital. Uh, the green and blue is the PRT, uh, the PRT products that we produce. So as you can see, over the months, we've been increasing, um, increasing the proportion of platelets that we produce that are PRT. By early 2021, uh, you know, about half of, our, um, half of our products were PRT treated, which we were really proud of. Uh, but of course, it's only half. So we, want, we, want, we made that jump. We had to make the jump from going from about 50% to 100%, and we did that very recently. <coughs> um, but you know, making that jump is very difficult as well operationally. And luckily, we had you know, a dedicated team here who pulled that off. Um, in late April, early May 2021, uh, Stanford Blood Center implemented 100% PRT platelet production. We are the only blood center of our size in the nation currently to do 100% PRT in our platelets. And this obviously really, really reduces the risk of bacterial contamination in all the units that we collect. And since then, you know, the, uh, we have continued to increase our production. Uh, this graph here just shows, as you can tell from the red line, the increasing productive trend that we have had. Now we're on, we're on track to produce about 17,000 platelets per year. Concomitant with this is an increasing uh, number of units being transfused, i.e. more patients are needing more units. Uh, the demand has also increased. And there's no way that we could accomplish this without a special help from you, all the help from you. Uh, all this is really honestly due to the help and the time that you provide for us to be able to provide to the patients who need this. So, you know, we implement 100% PRT. We're very proud of that. But you know, there are still things that can be improved, right? So is there a better way to sterilize blood products efficiently? So one of these um, ideas, uh, you know, research projects I've had that's kind of out of left field a little bit is using a linear particle accelerator to sterilize blood. So sterilizing by, sterilization by radiation is not something new. A sterilizing dose is considered to be about 25,000 gray. Now, if we're using the current technology uh, available to blood centers in most places right now, getting to a dose of 25,000 gray would take about one week to sterilize a few products. That obviously is not a scalable solution uh, on an operational level. But if we can harness the power of a linear particle accelerator to do that, we can, we can generate 25,000 gray in, in a few minutes. So 
if it works, this provides like a very sort of efficient way to sterilize products. Uh, so currently, uh, we're in collaboration with uh, folks from the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, Center and also uh, folks from Stanford University Radiation Oncology in trying to see if we can sterilize blood products, i.e. platelets, red cells, and plasma, and, and, and see if the product is still viable. Uh, so the studies are underway. I don't know if it will work. I hope it does, but I really don't know. But I guess that's why they call it an experiment, right? Uh, but if it works, uh, I think that'd be very exciting. And we'd be more than happy to share the news with you. So please stay tuned. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the, the time that you spent all this, all these years donating, what you, uh, donating all that blood that you do and doing what you do. Um, and so at this time, I just want to uh, uh, pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pham, for that insightful look at PRT innovation. Next, I'd like to welcome SBC's other chief medical officer, Dr. Suchi Pandey. Another driving force of innovation, Suchi is currently involved in an exciting research project that looks at potential applications of wearable technologies, for example, Apple Watches, in the blood donor setting. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Pandey. Thank you, Ross, for that introduction, and thank you all of you for joining us for this special virtual event where we celebrate all of you for your commitment to blood donation and helping to save patient lives every day. So as Ross mentioned, I am interested in potentially looking at the applications of wearable devices, you know, what we usually call smart watches or fitness trackers in the setting of blood donation. And you know, so first it's interesting to just learn how many people in the US currently wear smart watches or these fitness trackers. So there was a recent study in 2019 looking at about asking a little over 4,000 adults whether or not they wear um, these devices. And that study in 2019 showed that about 21% of Americans were wearing these devices, a little bit more female than male, and more in the younger age group of 18 to 50 versus 50 and above. So that was interesting, and I think you know, this survey was from about two years ago, and I'm sure in the last two years the numbers have actually gone up, but this is the baseline data that I was able to find. So we know that these smartwatches and fitness trackers, they have the ability to measure different health parameters. They almost all are measuring heart rate, and this is continuous monitoring. Also activity in the sense they're measuring your steps, uh, and also sleep patterns. In some of the newer models, they even will measure EKG, um, so electrocardiograms, your oxygenation, and then um, there's something called an accelerometer, which can measure falls as well. So the question is, can these devices that people are wearing have a role in detecting disease and monitoring health? And in fact, there have been more and more studies coming out using these wearable devices in different healthcare settings in detecting disease or monitoring health. So one of the big ones that was recently published and was very exciting was a collaboration between Apple and Stanford, where it's called the Apple Heart Study. And over 400,000 people uh, were enrolled in this study to basically see over the eight month um, clinical period of the, the study, if the, the smartwatch, the Apple Watch, would be able to detect abnormalities in heart rate. And if an abnormality in heart rate or heart rhythm was detected, then um, you would get a message. And here it is on, on the screen on the lower left. Your heart has shown signs of an irregular rhythm, suggestive of AFib. If you have not been diagnosed, and then it goes on to say, you know, follow up with your physician. So that study about um, 0.5% of the participants received this notification and were then able to follow up with their, their doctor or, or had the ability to do that. Another study uh, using wearable devices that has been uh, done at Stanford uh, was just recently published. And this one was looking, it was one of the first to show that smartwatch uh, data actually correlated with some lab results and could help predict health conditions like dehydration or anemia. So this is also very exciting and is one of the first studies to show that correlation. You know, there's also been some interesting studies recently, um, very small, but um, still, you know, I think uh, shows a, another exciting potential 
in transfusion recipients. So there are patients um, who require chronic transfusions, for example, a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome. And these patients require transfusions you know, every few weeks. So the question is that can a smartwatch that these patients are wearing help to better predict when they'll need their next transfusion? So very exciting stuff, and thus far the prelim results are showing that, yes, yeah, smartwatches and wearable devices can help with even predicting when a patient might need their next transfusion. So these are just a few examples. There's many other examples of, of smartwatches and wearable devices being used in, in healthcare. But the question that, that I am asking and, and other blood center physicians in the country are interested in is, what is the application and the potential use of these devices in the blood donor setting? So Stanford Blood Center and in partnership with Brigham and Women in Boston, we are spearheading some research uh, into this question and the use of wearables in the blood donor setting. And some of the potential applications that could be studied is first, you know, can a wearable device that a donor is wearing better predict a, a donor reaction? So fortunately, donor reactions are not common, um, but they can occur. And one of them is called a vasovagal reaction where someone can lose consciousness. Again, this is not common, but often it's, it's accompanied by a drop in pulse and a drop in blood pressure. So what we're asking is, can if a donor is wearing that smartwatch during their donation, and then there is this sudden decrease in pulse, can that smartwatch provide some level of notification that could help predict that that donor might be at higher risk? So that's one potential application that needs to be studied. Another is that can that smartwatch or a wearable device help to better predict um, recovery after donation? This is especially important in certain populations that are donating, you know, for example, if you think of an Uber athlete that is donating a marathon runner, you know, you would be able to better understand, you know, how long it would take that individual to get back to their baseline activity. So those are just two examples that um, we, we could study in the blood donor setting. So what are the next steps? Um, so the first is that I would like to perform a survey uh, with all of you, our blood donors, about wearables. I think it's important to understand just some baseline data before we actually design studies. So the goal would be to obtain this data, such as so the survey asks questions like, do you wear a smartwatch? How often do you wear that smartwatch? Um, what type do you wear? And then also questions like, would you be interested in participating in a study? And would you be interested or willing to share your smartwatch's data with blood center researchers in the future? So that survey will help us to just get some um, what we call feasibility to determine how to design future studies with smartwatches in our blood donors. Uh, so the survey has been developed and it has been approved by the research review board. And so we're working on now uh, sending it out via email. It will be an online survey to uh, the majority of our blood donors. So stay tuned. Uh, it's a short survey. It'll only take about five minutes. And I um, encourage you when you see this in your email to please uh, take the survey and it'll really help us to understand uh, some baseline data. I suspect that blood donors, especially in our area, all of you probably are wearing smartwatches at a much higher rate than that 21% that we found in that, the US survey, but we'll see. So then what's the next step? So the survey is just one simple thing we can do to understand some baseline data. Um, but then the next thing that we would like to do uh, is to actually do what we're calling a small tech pilot. So this would be where we have a small group of donors where we ask if they're interested in participating in a study uh, looking at smartwatches in the blood donor setting. And in this tech pilot, what we really want to do, we would ask the donor to be wearing the watch for a certain period before the donation, during the donation, and then after the donation. And these smartwatches, they, you know, wearable devices, they collect lots and lots of data. So the goal would be to determine how do we analyze all of that data and make sense of it. Uh, and this would lay the groundwork for how to do future studies where we would be enrolling a lot more donors. So the tech pilot we are planning to begin sometime in 2022. And some of you may, may hear from me uh, or uh, be reached out to to potentially participate in that small uh, tech pilot. So with that, I just want to thank all of you for 
letting me share with you this uh, new initiative and uh, exciting innovation that potentially uh, can change or, or help improve um, things like donor safety and, and other things within the, the blood donor setting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey, for that insight into wearable technologies. We look forward to things to come. Next up, I'll be introducing a recorded message from Dr. Melody Jung, Assistant Medical Director of SBC's Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics Laboratory, or HLA Lab. SBC's work in the HLA Lab largely concerns supporting transplant patients by ensuring histocompatibility and optimal HLA matches between transplant patients and donors which is the main immunological barrier in solid organ and blood marrow transplantations. Furthermore, it also performs critical genetic testing to help with diagnosis of certain diseases or prevention of severe drug reactions. Sharing more on HLA disease association and pharmacogenetic testing, please welcome Dr. Jung. Good morning, everyone. Very nice to meet you. My name is Melody Zhang. I am one of the medical directors of the Histocompatibility and the Immunogenetics Laboratory at the Stanford Blood Center. Today, with great pleasure, um, I would like to introduce to you some of the advancements on HOA disease association testing in our lab. The Stanford HOA lab has a long um, history of um, innovation. Um, Back in the 1960s, uh, when the HOA system was um, first discovered, this discovery led to revolutionizing um, transfusion and the transplantation compatibility testing. And the founding director of the Stanford HOA lab, Dr. Rose Pang, was well recognized as one of the pioneers uh, in HOA and referred to as the mother of HOA. In year 2000s, um, the Stanford HOE lab was among the first to implement the HOE typing on platelet donors to decrease turnaround time of a special blood product availability for a subset of patients uh, with complex needs. Those are the patients um, who had a lot of anti-HOE antibodies and are therefore difficult to identify compatible platelet units. In 2009, um, our lab developed and implemented the C1Q HOA antibody testing to improve organ transplantation outcomes. Um, this test um, helped to identify the most harmful anti-HOA antibodies to optimize the treatment of those patients, and it is now used as a standard test globally. In 2016, um, the Stanford HOA lab um, implemented the next generation sequencing based HOA typing to provide better and faster results and, of blood and marrow transplantation and also for uh, solid organ transplantation. In January of this year, we implemented the HOA disease association and the pharmacogenetics panels. And this is going to be the focus of my talk today. Um, some highlights of um, upcoming innovation. In November of this year, we plan to implement the gen next generation sequencing based post transplant engraftment testing, and hopefully, we will share information with you at a future event. So, I will start my introduction of HOA Disease Association and a pharmacogenetics panels. So, before we can appreciate um, the importance of doing HOE testing and how to use them clinically, we need to first um, understand the function of the HOE system and um, why it is so important in organ transplantation and the disease association testing. The HOE genes encode a set of um, cell surface molecules and their primary function is to present um, peptides, which are short segments of degraded proteins to uh, certain types of immune cells, uh, T cells. And they have this essential role uh, for the immune system to recognize foreign molecules. And therefore, they determine the compatibility between an organ donor and an organ recipient. The discovery and the characterization of the immune response genes actually led to the Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine being awarded to three scientists in 1980, and among whom Dr. Jean Doucette was the first one to characterize 
um, those molecules on the human leukocytes, and therefore they are named uh, HLA, which stands for human leukocyte antigens in human. Um, one distinct characteristic of the system is that it has an extraordinarily high level of diversity. Um, this region only accounts for about 0.1% of the genome, however, it accounts for over 10% of the diversity. And so far, over 30,000 of different HOA variants have been uh, found and documented. Each one of us um, has a unique set of HOA uh, gene variants inherited from our parents. So in addition to its critical role in organ transplantation, HOE has also been established as a region of the genome associated with the greatest, greatest number of human diseases. Um, those diseases um, have an immunological component, and those would include most, if not all, the autoimmune diseases. On the other hand, uh, it has an important role in pharmacogenetics testing, because in the ideal world, a therapeutic drug uh, developed for a particular disease should be if, um, effective and also safe for all the patients. However, in reality, drug efficacy can vary greatly uh, between individuals, uh, well tolerated by majority of the population, but may cause serious adverse reactions in a subset of uh, individuals. And the adverse drug reactions can be broadly divided into two types. Uh, type A uh, refers to those reactions, um, mostly predictable based on the drug's known pharmacological action, and also type B, which is a minority, 13% per, of those reactions. Um, it involves drug-induced immune responses and generally um, uh, non-predictable, uh, those independent and tend to be more severe. A subcategory um, of this type uh, comprises the T-cell mediated drug uh, hypersensitivities, and given the role of the HOE molecules in, in T cell stimulation, um, associations have been uh, found between those adverse drug reactions and uh, certain uh, variants of HOE genes. So in our lab, we uh, perform HOA typing testing of those clinically uh, relevant genes outlined on the left. And that is usually done uh, by a PCR SSO method for uh, disease association and pharmacogenetic uh, panels. And the way it works is that um, the gene interest will be amplified to generate many copies. And then we use specially uh, designed oligonucleotide probes to hybridize or bind to them. And then based on the positive or negative signals, we will be able to interpret the most likely um, uh, gene variants uh, carried by the patient. And if further detail is needed um, of this variant, we can do sequencing-based HOE typing, and that is done on the next generation sequencing um, platform. So what's shown on this slide, um, is the current um, HOA disease association and pharmacogenetic panels offered by our lab. Um, and you can see um, some disease-centric um, panels, and within each one, there's a default um, HOA gene to be typed. And then uh, based on the uh, typing result of that gene, uh, we can interpret uh, the disease risk um, for the patient. Um, we also have custom panels, um, and the ordering physician will be able to order the typing of any uh, HOA gene or combination of genes to meet any further needs not covered by the disease-centric panels. So how does HOA typing help with um, disease diagnoses? I want to show you uh, using one example of a celiac disease. So as we know, celiac disease is a complex autoimmune disorder. And in those patients, the immune system attack and damage our small bowel. When those patients eat food um, containing a protein called gluten, gluten can be found in certain types of grains, uh, such as wheat, um, rye, um, etc. And 
those patients may demonstrate um, symptoms uh, varying from no symptoms at all to um, a variety of uh, different problems as shown um, on the tap in the top panel here. Um, for example, weight loss, um, stomach and the muscle cramps, uh, numbness and tingling, um, and the joint pain. Um, so it has been found that certain HOA DQ molecules um, are strongly associated with the development of a celiac disease. And therefore, we uh, in our lab do HOA DQ typing and based on the DQ variants that we identify, um, we will be able to um, give an interpretation of the associated risk for developing uh, celiac disease uh, for patients. And this um, HOA typing um, is now very important in the diagnosis of celiac disease nowadays. Um, I want to use another example, allopurinol hypersensitivity reactions, uh, to show um, how HOA testing can help um, with a predicting of um, adverse drug reactions. So allopurinol is a commonly used drug to treat um, patients with gout um, and uh, elevated uric acid uh, levels in the blood uh, or cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. However, it has been found that um, those patients carrying a particular HOA B variant, uh, 5801, has significantly um, increased the risk of allopurinol induced severe um, cutaneous adverse reactions, as shown in the pictures uh, on the slide. I apologize that those photos are uh, visually difficult. Um, so as a result, um, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium um, strongly recommended uh, typing for HOEB before administering um, this, um, uh, this drug to patients. And if uh, this particular B variant is present, um, allopurinol is contraindicated. Okay, I hope this overview of HOA disease uh, association and pharmacogenetic testing is helpful to you. Um, this important work cannot be done without our dedicated um, HOA lab team shown in this photo, smiling at you. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I hope you enjoy the rest of the activities at the event today. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for that fascinating look into disease-associated testing. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage Jen Bennett, Marketing Manager. As some of you may know, SBC has been working for years now on the planning of and finally implementation of an SBC app. Jen has led this project from its inception and we are so excited to have her here today to talk about what has already been created and what exciting enhancement we can expect in the coming months. Please welcome Jen. Thank you, Ross, and good morning, everyone. So some of you may be aware that this past spring, we launched the beta development version of our SBC app. It's a mobile application for iPhone and Android phones that's been custom built for our SBC donors. It's our hope that the app is just another way we can continue improving the donation experience at SBC based on direct feedback from people like you, our most dedicated donors. So if you haven't had a chance to download and check out the app, I wanna walk you through a few of its current features and then give you a little sneak peek at what's coming. So right now, you can go to stanfordbloodcenter.org slash app and download the beta version from either the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Once downloaded and on your phone, and please note that this app is built for phones and not tablets yet, you can log into your existing Stanford Blood Center account. It's the same username and password you'd use if you logged into the donor portal on the web to make an appointment. And the app remembers your login, so there'll be less searching for forgotten passwords. If you don't yet have an account, not to worry, you can create one right from within the app. Once you're in, you'll see the very first advantage to downloading the app right away. You have now a digital donor ID card built right in. You can also see your eligibility, book a donation, and see any upcoming appointments on the Me tab. You'll even notice a new feature showing your latest earned badges, but more on that in just a moment. If you wanna dig a little deeper, 
You can click on either the ID card or the My Donor Info button to see your lifetime donations, accrued store points, test results, and all the badges you've earned so far or can earn. You can click to see all to view your complete test results and filter by year for easier sorting as well. Then hop on over to the Donate tab to book your next appointment. You can filter to look for an appointment in a specific date range and within range of a certain zip code, or just find one nearest to your current location. Then when you've found the perfect day and time, add your book donation to your phone's default calendar. On the day of your appointment, open up the app and you'll find that a button has appeared on your Me tab inviting you to complete your SBC pre-check. You can fill out your medical history questionnaire in advance and save a bit of time at your appointment. On the Learn tab, you can get answers to commonly asked questions, find out about upcoming and current promotions, read inspiring stories, and more. And on the Contact tab, you can connect with us directly during normal business hours, and now you have the option to text us as well, and speak with one of our team experts. So all of this right now is available in our beta version. So let's talk about what's next for the SBC app. When we launched the beta version, we surveyed a sampling of our SBC donors to get some feedback on the app and help guide our next phase of development. Some of you may even have been in that group, so thank you very much for your responses. Your feedback has directly impacted our full version set to launch this spring. In response to those requests, we're making some exciting changes. Soon, for iPhone users, after logging in the first time a user, with a username and password, you're going to have the option to use Face ID or Touch ID for subsequent logins. In addition, one of the most requested uh, improvements was the ability to cancel and book a new appointment within the app, so we'll be adding that feature shortly. Now, back to those badges. Gradually, over time, we're going to be adding more options for earning badges and tying those badges to other rewards, too, letting you earn extra store points or other incentives for being a dedicated donor. We have even more exciting ideas for this concept in the future, so look for some enhancements to those badges as time goes on. For now, you can check out what badges you can earn, click on them, and share with friends. You can help inspire others to donate through your own achievement. Starting with the full version of the app in the spring, you can put those well-earned loyalty points to good use. You'll be able to redeem your points right within the app in a fully integrated store and shopping cart experience. And behind the scenes, we're also making improvements to the entire store experience to help you get your rewards even sooner. More to come on that in a later date. And the most requested item of all, notifications. We are approaching notifications in the app thoughtfully to be sure they're a benefit and not a bother. So most notifications will be available only when you're using the app, like finding out about new promotions or alerts about earning new badges. But you can choose to be notified more broadly with appointment reminders, a note when you become eligible again, and a reminder to fill out your SBC pre-check on the day of your appointment. So while there's more to come for the SBC app, we hope you'll take a moment to download and try out the beta version and look for, for the full version in spring of 2022. And as with any beta app, you can expect to see changes happening slowly as we begin to implement some of these features. If you have suggestions for improvements in the meantime, we'd love your feedback. There's a survey available on our website at stanfordbloodcenter.org app. So thank you so much, and we really look forward to hearing what you think. Back to you, Ross. Thank you, Jen, for that exciting look at the SPC app. We have so much to look forward to. Now I'd like to pivot to something a bit different. The reason that we are all here today is the same reason we are able to fulfill our SBC mission every day, and that's all of you. Without your support, we simply wouldn't be able to save many of the lives we have. In honor of your selflessness and dedication, Team members from across SBC have recorded thank you messages we'd love to share. Please enjoy this video and know how truly appreciated you all are. Thank you so much for all your donations. You are truly all lifesavers. As somebody who's been on the receiving end of platelet donations and whole blood donations as well, I'm really grateful from the bottom of my heart. I wouldn't be here without all of you. We thank you from the bottom of our beating hearts for your selfless gift and cannot wait to have you back. My father was diagnosed with cancer and was in the hospital for about 10 months before he passed. And while his journey didn't end the way we wanted it to end, we had 
and have still so many precious memories and moments with him because of the 50 plus units of blood that he got. And so um, not only am I thanking you um, on behalf of all of our patients, but I'm thanking you as a family member of a very special patient. Every time they come in, they blow me away with their sincerity, their willingness, and their abject um, disappointment when they can't donate. We have the most dedicated, passionate group of donors in the country, and they answer the call and answer the bell for our patients every time we ask them, and I'm just so grateful uh, for, for their daily sacrifice. I would like to appreciate our donors that they have reached milestone with their continuous donation throughout the years. I feel that they are part of our family. I see the difference firsthand of what a blood product, whether it be red cells, platelets, plasma, can do for a patient and really does mean the difference between life and death. I say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I just want to tell our donors how so proud I am of their generosity and, and how caring they are to people they have not even met. I am always so in awe that not only will they give some of their time, but that they're giving part of their body to help save someone else. It's truly amazing to me. So all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you so much. My mom received multiple transfusions following uh, a pretty harrowing episode with chemotherapy for stage four ovarian cancer. My mom before transfusions and my mom after transfusions was night and day. So after she received blood, the color flooded back to her. She could play with her granddaughter and it was life changing. So thank you for your gift. To close out our speaking program, I'd like to pass the mic to Christine Trog. In 2019, Christine gave birth to her daughter, Emiliana, when Emiliana was just 23 weeks. As a micro preemie, Emiliana faced challenge after challenge, and for many months, the family wasn't sure if she would make it. Thanks to blood donors, her care team, and two absolutely incredible partners, Emiliana overcame all odds and is now a thriving toddler. Here to tell you more about her story, please welcome Christine. My name is Christine Gassetta-Trog, and I'm honored to be here today at this year's Precious Metal event to share our, our daughter Emiliana's journey with you. Emiliana was born extremely premature, and it's important to donors like you that I'm able to stand before you today and share our story. When my husband and I found out I was pregnant and was, we were having a little girl. We were over the moon excited as we had wanted a girl all along. We were even more excited when we found out the due date was in November as that's a very special month for us. My pregnancy had its ups and downs, but on July 18th, 2019, feeling something wasn't quite right, I made a doctor's appointment just as a precaution. I thought I was going in for something routine, but was shocked to learn that I was going into labor with a bulging bag and delivery was imminent. I was admitted to our home hospital. However, that hospital was unable to take a baby under 28 weeks. So I was transferred to Lucille Packard Children's Hospital where, when I was 22 weeks and six days pregnant. I was admitted for four days to LPCH and over those four days, the NICU team came in several times to speak with me and my husband about the grim reality of a baby born too early. They explained that her chances of survival were less than 50%, and if she did survive, would most likely have significant lifelong setbacks, including not being able to walk, talk, or eat on her own. My husband and I understood there were limits to what could be done in a situation like this, but agreed that if our baby had any quality of life, then we asked them to do everything possible to save our baby. We stayed as positive as possible considering the cards we were dealt and decided on her name right then and there. The name Emiliana means to strive, rival, and excel, and that name suits her perfectly. Despite being bound and determined to keep her inside as long as I could, there was no stopping the inevitable. 
On the afternoon of July 22nd, 2019, the day shift nurse and I were chatting and I could tell in that moment that by the look on her face that something she had seen on the monitor made her uneasy. She alerted the doctor on call and when the team arrived and did an ultrasound, the do things took a frightening turn. The doctor looked at me and said, we have a problem. Your bag is continuing to come down, but now the cord is coming down with it. And if your bag bursts, the cord will prolapse and your baby will die. We are taking you into the OR right now for an emergency C-section. One hour later, Emiliana was born and she was about the size of a Barbie doll. This was not the way we envisioned her coming into the world. When Emiliana was born, she came out strong, breathing on her own and even let out a cry. All the things that they said she probably wouldn't do. Since she was so small and completely fragile, I was unable to hold her like most mothers do when their babies are born. Her body was circulating only a few teaspoons of blood, so it was imperative that she receive transfusions frequently to keep her alive. She was immediately taken away and the team began working on getting her situated in her isolate, which would be her home for the next few months. After recovering from the surgery, they brought me in to see her and my hesitation being wheeled up to her isolate was very strong. I had seen premature babies before, but nothing like this. The isolate had to be kept at 90% humidity to keep the seven layers of skin she had moist and not tear. It was hard to see her through the glass. When I was able to see my baby girl, she didn't look like anything I had ever seen before. And I couldn't have even imagined. Weighing only 480 grams, 11 and a quarter inches long, with eyes still fused shut, that was my daughter. Tiny, but my... For the first two weeks, she was fighting the good fight. She needed to be intubated to keep her, to keep her breathing and to stay strong. Then all of a sudden, things took a frightening turn and she became very sick once again. I needed additional respiratory support and was put on an oscillator. She was unable to be moved while on the oscillator, which made it impossible for us to hold her, but we were able to put our hands through the portholes and give her hand hugs and read to her. She continued to decline and suddenly stopped eating and went into renal failure. Her body swelled up like a balloon and the doctors were baffled as to what was going on. The doctors ran a battery of tests and each one came back negative. Nobody had ever seen this before and the team was at a loss. The trial and error of tests and attempting to feed went on for two and a half months. One step forward, two steps back is the NICU motto and it couldn't be more true. As we would sit by her isolate, listening to the team talk during rounds, it all sounded like a new language that neither of us understood. The one thing we picked up on quickly was her oxygen saturation. We could see on the monitor when it would start to dip. We would see her turn pale and peaked, not moving enough oxygen through her little body. She would struggle and need more respiratory support, trying to move as much blood through her body as possible. Her saving grace was receiving blood transfusions. And once she received her, friend, her transfusion, she came back to life. Her color would come back. She would need less respiratory support. And as parents, we felt a sense of comfort in that moment. The transfusions were too many to count as they were given every day or every other day over several months. But the strength it gave her was amazing. Even though she was fighting an internal battle none of us were aware of at the time, she grew a little stronger every day. Her lungs continued to develop, and after 30 days, she was taken off the oscillator and moved to a conventional vent. Finally, at 34 days old, with the help of two nurses and a respiratory therapist, I was able to hold her for the first time. Day after day, we sat by Emiliana's isolate, waiting and hoping someone would give us the aha, or would give us the aha answer we had been looking for. After multiple x-rays, the team noticed a loop of bowel that looked odd in every film. After continuing to look at this, someone finally noticed a pattern, and after much discussion, discussion uh, uh, a very risky exploratory surgery was our only option. The risk was extremely high, so high that the surgical team wasn't willing to take a baby under four pounds to surgery, and Emiliana was barely three pounds at the time. We continued to speak with the surgical team regarding our daughter's care plan, and they made their hesitation very clear, bluntly saying, 
the risk is too high, she most likely will not survive the surgery. To which my husband responded, there is risk with her sitting in this isolate and she may not survive here either. The surgical team continued to work with us and we decided to roll the dice and proceed with the surgery. The surgery was scheduled for early October and the exploratory surgery was a success. The surgical team was amazed at what they found when they did the operation. They determined that shortly after she was born, her intestines perforated, which caused her to get neck, necrotizing enterocolitis, which is often fatal in premature babies. However, Emiliana's body sealed off the perforation to her abdominal wall, which caused her to survive something that should have killed her. The surgeons were able to remove the section of bowel that was diseased and reconnect her that same day without an ostomy. She did return with a feeding tube, as that would have been another surgery down the line. Thankfully, prior to this turn of events, we were accustomed to the transfusion routine, which gave us additional peace of mind, should she need it. In addition to the success of her surgery, after 101 days of being intubated, she was extubated on October 31st, 2019, and has not required respiratory support since. After surviving a res risky exploratory surgery, several blood clots in her heart, almost losing her sight, catching H1N1 with influenza A, it was finally time to go home. On February 22nd, 2020, exactly seven months from the day Emiliana was born, we were discharged from the hospital and were able to go home and start our life as a trio. Today, Emiliana is a vibrant two-year-old who loves running around, listening to music, playing peekaboo, playing with her stuffed animals, and reading books. When she was 20 months old, her feeding tube was removed earlier than anticipated as she no longer needed it and eats completely on her own like a champ. Her favorite words are uh-oh, baby, and Coco, our family dog. We get the occasional mama and daddy, too. She has beaten the odds even when the odds were stacked against her and truly is an Emiliana in every sense of the word. Myself, my husband, and Emiliana would like to share our heartfelt thanks to everyone who donated this precious life giving resource. The time you take out of your day may feel small to you, but to us and so many others, you gave hope and a life-changing opportunity to a situation which may have felt hopeless. You are truly a giving a lifeline to those who may, whose lives may be hanging in the balance. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for your family's moving story and for being an inspiration to us all. Well, that concludes our 25th annual Precious Metal event. Please be sure to check your email inboxes for a survey, which we really hope you'll fill out so that we can continue to improve the event in the coming years. We go over each response as a team, so it's a great way to have your voice heard. We'll also be reaching out to the gift card raffle winners in the next few days. Before you go, I'd like to thank you all one last time for your flexibility and attendance this year and for all the incredible work you do saving lives in our community. Have a wonderful rest of the day and again, happy Veterans Day.